Amos. Amos is one of the Old Testament prophets, and it'll be found there just before you get to the New Testament, pretty close to the end of the Old Testament, the book of Amos. Right before Obadiah, which is right before Jonah, and you're getting right on in, near the end there of the Old Testament. And we'll look here in some scripture to what God said through the prophet Amos and then bring you a message from the Word of God. Regardless of what people think, God does everything He does for our good. And God is not mean. God is not bully. God does everything for our good. And what happens to you, it's God wanting to work in your life, bring you to Him. In Amos chapter 4, I want to begin reading with verse number 6. And you'll see some things here in the Word of God that uh, we'll use for the text for the message this morning. Amos chapter 4 and verse number 6. And I also have given you cleanness of teeth. That means you didn't have nothing to eat. In all your cities and want of bread in all your places, yet have ye not returned unto me, saith the Lord. Now stop right there. The Lord said here, I took your food away from you, and you still wouldn't come to me and get right. Verse 7, And I also, also I have, withholding the rain from you, when there were yet three months to the harvest. And I caused it to rain upon one city, and caused it not to rain upon another city. One piece was rained upon, and the piece whereupon it rained not withered. So two or three cities wandered unto one city to drink water, but they were satisfied. Yet have ye not returned unto me, saith the Lord. Here again in this verse, the Lord said, I, I hadn't let it rain on you. Your crops won't grow. I thought if I stopped the rain and your crops wouldn't grow, then you'd get down on your knees and, and you would pray and you'd get right with me. But you still won't. Look what he said in verse 9. I have smitten you with blasting and mildew. When your gardens and your vineyards and your fig trees and your olive trees increased, the palmer worm devoured them. Yet have ye, have ye not returned unto me, saith the Lord. There again, the Lord said, I, I hit you in the pocketbook. I hit your economy. He said, you just had one thing of trouble right after another, and you still want to God and get right. And the Lord said, I'm doing all this stuff trying to jar you and stick you and shake you and wake you and bring you to me, but you won't listen. Look at verse number 10. I have sent among pestilence after the manner of Egypt. Your young men have I slain with a sword. And I have taken away your horses, and I have made this think of your camps to come up in, under your nostrils. Yet have ye not returned unto me, saith the Lord. Now think about this. Not only on, a, on a, a, an individual level, but on a national level. Do you realize that all the bad things that happen, our kids getting killed on highways, drug overdoses, alcohol kill them by the thousands, murders on our street. God don't like it, but God allowed all this stuff to take place. and God allowed diseases to come. He's trying to get people to repent and come to Him and get right. And people still won't repent. Verse number 11. I have overthrown some of you. God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. And you were as a firebrand plucked out of the burning. Yet... Have ye not returned unto me, saith the Lord. Therefore, thus will I do unto thee, O Israel, and because I will do this unto thee, prepare to meet thy God, O Israel. It's a dangerous thing when God's dealing with you to say no to God. And this morning I want to preach to you on the subject, what will it take to bring you to God? What will it take to bring you to to God. I've seen the Lord deal with some of, maybe some of you people sitting right here in this room this morning for a long time. 
And it seems like you're running from God this morning. And the Lord will deal with you. And you'll keep running. And God will hit you. And you'll keep running. And the Lord will hit you. And you'll keep running. And the Lord will hit you with something. And you'll keep running. Bam! You find out something's wrong with you physically. Bam! You find out you lost your job. Bam! You find out you got trouble in the family. Bam! And all these things God is using to say, Come to me. Come to me. And the Bible said, Yet ye have not come to me, saith the Lord. What's it going to take? to bring you to God. I want to show you some men in the Bible this morning. Keep your Bible open there. I want to point out to you several men that it took God doing something to them to bring them to God. They start off mildly in Genesis chapter number 5 this morning. And I want to show you a man by the name of Enoch. Look at Enoch in Genesis chapter number 5 and verse number 21. You know what it took? It took the birth of a baby to bring Enoch to God. It took him becoming a father and bringing a little boy into the world. In Genesis 5 and verse 21, And Enoch sixty and five years, and begot Methuselah. And Enoch walked with God after he begot Methuselah three hundred years, and begot sons and daughters. There's something about the birth of that little boy that Enoch walked with God for three hundred years. Years after he was born. You know, sometimes you, I used to think God gave us children for us to raise them. I found out God gives us children to make us grow up and do what we're supposed to do. I've seen many people just live hazardly and a slipshod, halfway Christian life. But when they bring that little baby home, they look at them two little eyes. Those are two little hands, those little feet that will one day spend eternity in heaven or hell. And they say, hey man, I've got a responsibility. This is my child. And that child will be used by God to bring them to himself. Thank the Lord if that happens. That baby boy was born and they got serious with serving God. If you're here this morning and you've got kids, you are doubly serious about serving God. For you not only have yourself to answer for one day, but you will answer to God for those little children that call you mama and call you daddy. I'm saying to you this morning, if you've got a little boy or a little girl that looks up and calls you daddy, looks up to you and calls you mama, you are not just facing God for you, you're facing God for them. And for the example you set in front of your kids, you are gonna, someday going to stand right in front of God Almighty and give an account of God. It took a baby to bring Enoch to God. But let me show you another one. Acts chapter number 16. It took an earthquake to bring the Philippian jailer to God. He was a man here who kept the, the jail. And in Acts chapter 16, that's the over in the New Testament, right after all the four Gospels, Acts chapter number 16. And in the book of Acts chapter 16, there was two fellows in jail by the name of Paul and Silas. And the Bible said in uh, Acts chapter number 16, that, uh, you know, they were in jail here and... Uh, uh, they begin to uh, uh, pray and they begin to cry out and call on God and worship the Lord. And you'll notice in verse number 25, and at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God. And the prisoners heard them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prisons were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's bands were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, waking out of his sleep, seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. But Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, we are all here. Then he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Now that earthquake may seem like a terrible thing, but that earthquake was the best favor that God ever done for that old boy. God let that earthquake come and it brought him to God. You know, there's a lot of people say, why did God, if there's a God in heaven, why did He let that earthquake come to save? Well, I'll tell you something, you ought not have to be too smart to figure out why God would let an earthquake come to San Francisco. He's got churches and Bibles everywhere. That don't do much good. People don't listen to the preaching. People don't want to read the Bible. 
People just go on and on in sin. And God loves them so much He don't want them to go to hell. So He let an earthquake come to bring them to God. And a lot of people did come to God when that earthquake hit San Francisco. Do you realize this week there has been more earthquakes this week? Have you heard on the news? There's been more earthquakes this past week than there has been in no telling how long. It seems like God is shaking the earth. He's shaking the earth. He's shaking the earth more than ever. You say, Brother Danny, if God's good and God loves people, why does He cause earthquakes to come? You see, the Lord can see more than we can see. He can see the future. He can see them people in hell. And He said, it's better off to get your house shut down and maybe to be put in a hospital and get saved and go to heaven than it is to live out your life and be just stand there and watch them go to hell. And it took that earthquake to bring them to God. I want to say this morning, if it takes an earthquake to bring you to God, hallelujah for the earthquake. Amen. If it takes a tragedy to get you right with God, then let the tragedy come. Anything, anything this morning beats going to hell and you die. It took an earthquake for that old boy. You see, he had him in jail there. And old Paul and Silas were in there and they were tied up. And the Bible said that old jailer was in here. He was propped up with his feet back here about half asleep. And all the doors were locked. And he has been there, you know, a snoo out. He had been playing cards or something. And while he was just sitting there like that, uh, Paul and Silas sighted dead sing a song. And and boy, there Paul looked at Silas, and Silas looked at Paul. He said, well, it's about midnight, Silas. You ready? Let's have a little service here before we kick out for the night. And he said, let's do it. What do you want to sing? And one of them said, uh, I was burdened down with sin. No happiness found within. And they got their parts to go in there, and they start saying, I remember the day when the Lord saved me. And buddy, I want you to know God looked them from heaven. He saw Paul and Silas, his servants, in there singing. He saw this boy over here lost without God. They had been witnessing to him. Listen, that old boy didn't give them preachers a time of day as long as them prison bars was sturdy and as long as them prison bars were steadfast and that floor was, was still. But boy, when the Lord come on the scene and God moved in and God began to touch that thing and the Lord started going... Like that right there. Buddy, I want you to know, you start listening to the preacher when the ground starts shaking under you. And I, there's somebody said Paul and Silas sung the jailhouse rock before Elvis' grandma was ever born. And God looked down and He said, Amen! And God said, Amen. That whole prison started shaking and that building started doing like this. And buddy, the doors flew open and that jailer jumped up and said, Oh no, oh God, no. He started to kill himself and commit suicide because he thought there was all left. He ran in there and he seen them preachers. And I want to tell you this too. He went to Paul and Silas. He didn't go to them other preachers. He knew who had God in there. He knew who had the Lord. They had witnessed to him. They had given their testimony. They, he had heard them in there preaching and singing. He come down in there and he said, Sirs, what must I do to get saved? He said, I'm tired of running from God. A God that's big enough that He can shake this jail. I'm willing to serve Him. I'm willing to live for Him. And he got saved and his wife got saved saved. And his kids got saved that night. And it took that earthquake to bring him to God. And I want to say tonight, ladies and gentlemen, this morning, ladies and gentlemen, some of them people out in California didn't make it through that earthquake. It killed them. But God used that to bring other people to God. You know, they said when Hurricane Hugo come through South Carolina a few months ago, that was the closest thing South Carolina had to revive on years. There's people down under the coffee tables praying. They were down under the bed where the lamp and the chandeliers falling on the coffee tables. They, they were seeing the pictures fall off of the wall. They were seeing mirrors break facing on the wall. They would look back, they'd see a big oak tree limp that big stick right through their living room and right in the back, out of the back of their sofa. They were down under that bed saying, oh my God, I'm sorry for the way I've been living. There was people probably kicked out their boyfriends and girlfriends. They got their act together and gave up drinking liquor and right with God. You say, what do you say about that? I say, hallelujah. That's what it took to bring them to God. And listen, if God uses a tragedy to bring you to Him, He's done you the best favor anybody's ever done you, friend. Don't you get mad and say, mean old God, let this happen. That's good. God loves you enough to allow things to happen. You won't listen when things are going good, so God has to let something bad to get your attention. Amen? What will it take to bring you to God? Now listen, you can save yourself a lot of trouble this morning, but most of you won't do it.
If you're here this morning, you're not saved. You can save yourself a lot of trouble by getting up in your right mind with a healthy body, walking down here, saying, Dear God, I know you're in control of this thing. I know you can snuff me out and I'll be in hell anytime you choose. God, I want to live for you and serve you and save yourself a tragedy. But if you don't, what's it going to take? Let me show you one in Daniel chapter 4 in the book of Daniel in the Old Testament. Nebuchadnezzar. It took a nervous breakdown to bring Nebuchadnezzar to God. You know what Nebuchadnezzar's problem was? He was full of his self. He was so proud and so cocky. I mean, he thought he was absolutely hot stuff. And I hear you a lot these days about self-esteem. And I know there's a good place in Christianity for some counseling and some Christian psychology. And I'm not against all of that. But I tell you what, all you hear nowadays is people need to raise their self-esteem. They'll quit doing drugs. People need to raise... Hey man, there ain't never been a time in history when people thought more of their self than they do now. People work. You, uh, they spend. They spend more time getting working on this old flesh, primping this old flesh, putting. Oh Lord, I don't know what they put on their skin nowadays. I mean, they're doing everything in the world, spending money, doing everything in the world just to try to look better. And there's nothing wrong with fixing up the best you can. But our problem ain't. We got too high of a self-esteem. Nebuchadnezzar thought he is hot stuff. See. He thought, boy, I'm big shot and ain't nobody like me. But I want you to notice, he had a dream one night. And he dreamed he seen this big old tree there in verse 20. And he had fair leaves in it in verse 21. And it's grown in verse 22. But he saw a watcher come down in verse 23. And he said, let it be cut down. And in verse 24, he told him the interpretation. He said, they're going to drive you from men, and your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. I'm in verse 25. And they shall make thee to eat grass as an oxen. They wet thee with the dew of heaven. Seven times shall pass over thee, till thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth it to whomsoever he will. Amen. Daniel told that old boy, he said, listen, king. God don't want to have to do this to you. God is going to have to do something to you to get your attention. Now, folks, this morning, God is able to do whatever He has to do to get your attention. You hear me back there? All of you listening? God is able to get your attention. You may be just haphazard living for God and about half living for the devil. Let me tell you, God's able to get your attention. He's got this old boy down. He said, buddy, you're going to mess up. And this old watcher come down and he goes in the dream. And Daniel told him this. He said, son, that tree is you. And you're big and strong. Birds come and lie on your limb. But he said, they're going to cut you down. And you're going to go out and eat straw like a dumb ox. And you're going to lose your brain for seven years until you figure out that God is God. And by the time you're crazy for seven years, you'll be willing to live right. And boy, old Nebuchadnezzar said, well, I don't know so much about that. And it came to pass one year later. Y'all hear me this morning? One year later. Sometimes it don't happen overnight. Sometimes you think, oh, well, Brother Danny said something's going to happen and it ain't never happened yet. Well, just hold tight, sonny boy. God ain't forgot it. It was one full year. And Nebuchadnezzar was out walking on the front porch. And he said, boy, I'm big shot Nebuchadnezzar. I am the king. And all this land belongs to me. And I've got anything I want. And blah, God took his mind. And his fingernails growed out here like an eagle. And his hair come out like feathers. I've seen people like that. On posters and TV lately. You reckon their mind's gone? A man that wants feathers way down his back ain't got no brain. His mind ain't right. Now for a woman that looks pretty and it's supposed to be, but not man, not man. So that aggravates you to death. You get out here trying to work and sweat and that hair falling in your face. You know what that is? Nature itself teaching you. And boy, I tell you what, uh, old Nebuchadnezzar got out there and put somebody said, where's the king? And they said, well, the king don't want no visitors. And they said, where's the king? We come from a far country. Where's he at? I want to see the king. They said, well, he's out in the pasture. What do you mean he's out in the pasture? He, and he got servants to feed the cows for him. They said, he don't feed the cows. He am one. 
And they went out there and there was the king. And he was behind the fence like this. Down there, you know, like barking like a dog or something. And they said, that is King Nebuchadnezzar. Slobber coming down both sides of his mouth. Great big old fingernails. How all of you look like a wild maniac. And everybody said, oh, it's awful. That man was brilliant. He was a great politician. He was the king of the land. Look at what happened to him. Seven times passed over him. God let him stay in that shape seven years. And then they'll look down and say, well, I reckon it's about time, Nebuchadnezzar. If I give you mine back, will you live right? And he said, you better believe I will. And buddy, God gave him his mind back. And he got up there and he said, he didn't get up there and say, I'm big Nebuchadnezzar no more. He said, there's a most high in heaven that rule. It took him a nervous breakdown to bring Nebuchadnezzar to God. I'm telling you, ladies and gentlemen, this morning, God knows what it'll take to bring you down. God knows what it'll take to get you in. God knows what it'll take to get a hold of your heart. God knows how to hit you. God knows just where to hit you. God God knows that tender spot. God knows that place where you meet, where you can be touched that nothing else can touch you. What will it take to bring you to God today? I'll show you another one. It took a fish ride for Jonah. I'll not ask you to turn to this one. Most of you know the story. But the story of Jonah basically is like this. Four chapters. Chapter number one, Jonah running from God. Chapter number 2, Jonah running to God. Chapter number 3, Jonah running with God. Chapter number 4, Jonah running ahead of God. What Jonah got there that morning, that day was, when God said go that way, Jonah went that way. God said, Jonah... Arise. And Jonah said, well, help me there, Lord. He said, I want you to go down there to Nineveh and I want you to preach a sermon. Tell them that I'm going to destroy it. And Jonah said, I don't believe I want to do that. And he went this way. And God said, you ought not to go that way. He said, I don't care what you say, God. I'm going that way. Now, when you get like that, you're getting in trouble. When you know God wants you to go one way, you deliberately go another way, you are getting in trouble. You listen to me. Some of you teenagers in here this morning, you're headed into summertime. You're headed into that time. You hear me? Hey, teenagers, raise your hand. Teenagers, raise your hand. You're headed into this summer. There's a bunch of you here this morning. I'm going to tell you what. The devil's going to try to get you one way. And God's going to try to get you to go another way. You better be careful running from God. Because God knows what it takes to bring you back to Him. And, the, and, the, and Jonah went this way. And he said, I'll go down. And he went down to Tarsus. And he went down to the ship. And he got on the ship. And he got down in the sides of the boat. And he got down in the cracks down there. And then he laid down. He went down, 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 down. Every time you leave God, you go down, 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 down. You, look, you read the first chapter of Jonah and see how many times the word down is mentioned. So, Jonah goes down, 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 down. Lays down, goes to sleep. Off goes the ship. He thinks, ha, ha, nobody knows where I'm at. People in Nineveh don't know where I'm at. God will raise up somebody else. I don't feel worthy to preach to Nineveh. Let one of these other young preachers go and preach to Nineveh. I just don't feel like the Lord could use me over there. After all, I don't even like them people. And about that time, the wind started blowing and that old ship started a tossing. Jonah was secure. You, you might feel secure for a while running from God, but God controls the wind. And buddy, that ship started doing like this and people started getting scared and saying, oh no, oh no, oh no, 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 we're going to die. And somebody said, get that fool up over there laying there in that bank. And in there, hip him. He, we're all going to drown. Somebody walked up and said, Hey, man, wake up. He jumped up and said, What's going on? They said, We're about to sing. What is wrong? And Jonah knew right then that it was God talking to him. Have you ever been running from God and something happened? And you know good and well it's a voice of God speaking to you. God said, Hey, boy. Hey, boy. You've been out there running from God. You come around the curve and meet somebody head on, barely miss them about that much, and the voice of the Lord speaks to you and say, I'm warning you. I'm warning you. I'm warning you. Pretty soon it's going to be more than a warning. Pretty soon you think you can get by. You just get by in the movies, brother. And the reason they get by in the movies is because it's fake. It ain't real life. And that way. He said, it's my fault. And they threw him overboard. Can you imagine that? 
You know, I've been out on the ocean. Well, we were on a ship just one time. And it was scary. Boy, you wouldn't believe it. It's scarier than an airplane. For some reason or another, it's scarier than an airplane. Because all that water. You think, buddy, if this thing goes down, I mean, I'm history. I can't swim that far. You look, you look around and you can't see nothing but water in every direction. And how terrible it would be for somebody to pick you up and throw you in that water. You go down like that, you know, and you come up like a blah, 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 and there goes the boat off down through there somewhere. God had spoke to this whale. And this whale was hungry. He's like a submarine going around in there. And that whale said to his buddy, I'm hungry. You know what I'd like to have? A mess of man. I'm going to go down to man camp and get me a mess of man's hush puppies. French fries. I ain't had none in a long time. Believe I smell it! Boy, he come around through there. Sure enough, there come the preacher. And, and all of a sudden, while Jonah was gasping for breath and air, everything got pitch black, dark. And he felt himself it's like on a, it felt like a water bed he was on. It was real slick. And he went, shh, down like a water slide into that well belly. Little pool popped up right when he hit the bottom of that little pool and that blubber. Can you imagine the smell? Gastrical intestinal juices in that whale's stomach. Hey man, them things can swallow a shark and digest it. Can you imagine how strong you can open your eyes in there? Seaweed wrapped around his neck. Somebody said, Bull Jonah made a great preacher after he got his degree from whale. Brother, God has got a way of getting your attention. You say, oh, brother, there ain't no whale. Yeah, God's got a lot of whales out here can swallow you. You might not be a fish, uh, get in a fish's belly, literally, but God's got them fight your whales. God let, you know what I've seen the Lord do? Something go wrong, cost you a bunch of money. You lay out of church, run from God, just try to make money, something will happen to get it. That's a whale, man. That's a whale. One will swallow you. And buddy, I tell you what, old Jonah, it took a whale ride for Jonah to get right. And I'm telling you, after he spent three days in that place, buddy, he was ready to go to Nineveh and preach. He sure changed his tune about preaching. He changed his mind about the Ninevites. Buddy, God's got ways of bringing you down. Three days before, he wouldn't fool with them. By the time that whale spewed him out on the beach, and he had whale vomit all over him, seaweed wrapped around his neck, his hair matted together, he hit the beach doing 90 mile an hour. It was a three day journey to Nineveh, and Jonah made it in one day. Amen. <laughs> About a day journey. That's what Wesley Grant said. Said it was a three day journey, and God put Jonah in the overdrive, and he made it in one day. And buddy, he come in like, his wheels like that, like a, like a wheel. On a, on a, a little old scooter or something, and he come into town saying, "Yet forty days, none of be overthrown." And they said, "Lord, I want you to look that suit. I never seen a preacher dressed like that. Seaweed tie looks like something Michael Jackson would wear." And they said, "No, sir, buddy." He said, "I got my degree down there in the bottom of that fish, and I'm ready to preach. I don't care who likes it, who don't like it. God's got my attention. I've got right with God. I will ask you this morning, what will it take for God to get you?" took rags, poverty, and bankruptcy for God to get the prodigal son. Is God going to have to let you lose everything you've got, sir? You say, me no God wouldn't do that. If God let that happen to you and it got you right with God, that'd be the best favor God ever done you. You ain't going to like this, some of you. are not going to understand it, some of you. But if our nation was to go bankrupt, and I'm not saying I hope this happens. I'm, the Lord's will be done. That's God's business. If our nation goes bankrupt and our economy collapses, it just might be the best thing that could happen to us. If that's what it takes to get the dirty movies off the, off the airways, to get the liquor bottles off the shelves, to put up the, the pornographers out of business, to stop the drug traffic, and people to get in the house of God and pray once again, like people used to call on God in community. If that's what it takes, so be it, God! Let it happen. What will it take 
prodigal son, he had everything a man could want when he left home. But he went down there and the Bible said he wasted his substance with riotous lips and he wound up broke without a dime to his name. And right there in that pig pen, lost his money, lost his girlfriend, lost his bank account, lost his camel, lost his nice clothes, lost his nice apartment. He said, okay, God. And he come back home and said, Father, I've sinned. Best thing that ever happened to that boy was going broke. Because he got right with his father. There'll be one last one I'll give this morning. You listen carefully. You listen carefully now. This is tragic. It took a funeral to get David right with God. You hear me? You hear me, Daddy? It took a funeral for David to really get right with God. Some of you daddies in here this, this morning, you say, God would never take my precious boy or one of my girls or one of my boys. Yeah, he would. If that's what it takes to get you right with God, daddy. David, the man of God that loved God with all of his heart in Second Samuel, you'll notice that you won't have to turn there, but in Second Samuel where David committed sin. Now David's sin was this. He saw a woman. He lusted for that woman. He had her brought. He committed adultery with that woman. He had that woman's ki husband killed. David's sin was murder. David adultery. And David's heart wasn't right with God as it had been in the past. And David had committed that wicked sin against God. And boy, the Lord, he, God did forgive him. God did help him. But you know what God did to really get a hold of David? When that little baby was born out of that illicit relationship between... God, no, God, no, let it live, let it live. Oh, God, it's just a little baby. God, it's got its whole life. God, not that, not that. Somebody put on the shoulder. Said your baby's dead. David looked at that little baby in that casket. He got right. He got right. I heard of a lady not too many years ago whom God had dealt with. You ladies listen to me. She, she had evidently had been saved. She had got out of the will of God. She is running from God. And, and she wasn't living right. She quit going to church. All her and her husband thought about was pleasure, swimming pool, going to the picnics on the weekends. All these things left God out of their life. Used her kids for an excuse. One morning she's backing out of the driveway. And that little kid got under the back tire of that car. And she ran over it and took that kid's life just like that. And at the funeral home told the preacher that's what it took. She said, I'm not accusing God. God was dealing with me. But I wouldn't listen to God. That's what it took. To bring me to God. I know of a preacher. Listen, fellas. Listen, men. This man of God got discouraged. He quit church. Quit preaching. He quit serving God altogether. Just started staying at home on Sundays. Had a little bitty boy, something like three or four years old. One morning they got to looking for him. Couldn't find him. He'd wander out in the backyard and they didn't pay much attention to it. And one morning they got to looking for him and couldn't find him. And finally somebody come screaming. The little boy had left their yard. Went across their backyard. Went into the neighbor's yard. And was laying face down floating in the swimming pool of their neighbor. Drowned. What day was it, preacher? It was Sunday. What time was it, preacher? It was 11 o'clock on Sunday morning. Instead of sitting in a church pew, singing in the choir, preaching a sermon, serving God with his little boy in church, he was pulling his boy's body out of a swimming pool. He said, what happened to him? Huh? I guess he got right with God. What's it going to take to bring you to God? 
Oh, you're not scared. Okay, okay, it's your life. It's free country. You can do what you want to. You're getting it the easy way this morning. If you won't listen, God will get you the hard way. But He will get you. Everybody in here, God will get you. And He's doing you the best favor He's ever done you. If it brings you to God. Let's stand and bow our heads. I believe there's some people here this morning. Listen carefully. Heads are bowed. Christians are praying. I believe there's some people here this morning say, Preacher, God spoke to me through the message. I believe the Lord gave you the message, Brother Danny, for me to hear. What's it going to take to bring me to God? Brother Danny, I don't want to. I have to go wind up in a fish's belly or in a funeral home. I don't wait till God has to allow tragedy to come to my life. I want to get right with God now. I want to get right with God now. And lead my family as a husband, my kids as a wife, my mom and daddy as a Christian ought to. You know what you ought to do? We're going to pray. You ought to get out of your seat. Make your way down here to this altar. And say, God, I want to get it done the easy way. Christians pray. We'll have you to come. Father, Lord, do what ought to be done this morning. I've tried to deliver what I believe you wanted me to. And I pray the word of God will not return void. That somebody here this morning will make that step eternally, once and for all. There's somebody here running from you, Lord, help them to realize just a little bit how much you love them, what you can use them for and make out of their lives. We'll praise you and we'll thank you in Jesus' name.